Celebrating 42 seasons on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, chronic wasting disease in deer. The count is up to nine in Mississippi. A kernel of truth, Super Bowl advertising offends big corn. Confused about fertilizers? Success happens. Gary Bachman has the scoop. And urban farming. The learning curve can be steep, but so can the payoff. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. An update on a story we've covered in detail over the last several months, chronic wasting disease in deer. Mississippi officials say they have discovered three more cases for a total of nine since early last year. The first was in Issaquina County, the new ones in Benton and Marshall counties. Authorities say they're unsure how CWD was introduced in the state. They're keeping tabs on the management zone. Also in Mississippi, meat labeling continues in the news. New fake meat legislation has passed overwhelmingly in the Mississippi House. It moves on to the state Senate. In Mississippi, as in much of the country, traditional meat organizations are pushing to prevent cell-based products from being called meat. Both the FDA and the USDA are claiming jurisdiction in that growing industry. And finally, in Mississippi, as we projected last week, a new bill to allow Electric Power Association's EPAs to provide high-speed Internet has been signed into law. Bill 366, the Mississippi Broadband Enabling Act, removes restrictions on EPAs that date back to the 1940s. The new law has wide-ranging support, though a plan to pay for the infrastructure has yet to appear. In global trade, the stage is set for talks between the U.S. and the EU, though it appears there's not much room for compromise. The U.S. is seeking greater access to ag markets in the EU, but that market is strong politically. Later this month, the EU will vote on whether to embrace trade with America. Many are saying that shouldn't happen, while other tariffs, uh, tariffs in other sectors are still in effect. And a ceasefire in the American trade war with China is still on for now. Lately, China has made impressive purchases from the U.S., including another 612 metric tons of soybeans. That after a pledge to buy 5 million tons during trade negotiations. Still, during his State of the Union speech this week, President Trump said China must pledge to make what he called real structural change to its trade policy and be willing to protect American jobs. Some are calling the possible end of the ceasefire on March 2nd terrifying. And finally, leaders in Iowa, the nation's largest by far producer of ethanol, met recently at the Iowa Renewable Fuels Summit. More than half of Iowa's corn crop goes to ethanol. Still fresh in everybody's mind, many of the 2018 refinery exemptions to the Renewable Fuels Standard, RFS. Many of those were handed out, some say like candy, by former EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt. Some of those cases are destined for the courtroom. The outcome, outcome could affect hundreds of millions of gallons of ethanol. With the pressure that ag producers have been under for so long, you'd think a little tough love might be the last thing they want to hear. When the markets are down and you're complaining about not making a whole lot of money and there's other options available and people in the state and resources available on the state level and the, the federal level to help you find markets, then you need to explore every opportunity you have. And therein lies the message to farmers. It's a different world out there, and your job is to find new markets for your crops. That was the basis for a recent two-day symposium, one aimed at empowering pressured farmers to do exactly that, find ways to get everything they raise or grow in front of new customers. Here's Farm Week's Amy Myers with the story. Sell it elsewhere overseas. That's the word from professionals at the 2019 International Ag Markets Workshop. It's a new message for these farmers here at Mississippi State hoping to sidestep the trade wars by selling to new customers. 
it's important for us to continue down the path of looking at other agreements that we can do bilaterally with uh, some of the TPP countries or maybe the European Union. I was able to take a trade trip to Cuba a couple of years ago and they are extremely interested in trading rice with the United States and shipping that rice out of the port of Gulfport. Uh, it could be a huge economic advantage for us. There are various free trade agreements that we have with Central America, with island nations, um, with our northern and southern neighbors. A lot of island nations, they import their foods. And you know what? They're quite cozy with the U.S. You wouldn't think the Dominican Republic would want U.S. beef, but they sure do. So as important as China is as a trade partner, it's certainly not the only market for American products. As we await the outcome of trade talks, these farmers are learning what the experts already know that putting more eggs in other baskets is the smartest marketing choice. I'm Amy Myers reporting. The good news is that producers do have support at both the state and national levels. Locally, contact your county's extension office. There are more than 2,900 of them nationwide. And speaking of corn, earlier in the show, if you watched the Super Bowl, you know that a few choice words were said about corn. Well, kinda. And that's how you brew it. Um, my king, this corn syrup was just delivered. It was all part of the Anheuser-Busch Dilly Dilly campaign for its popular beer, Bud Light. This one touting its non-use of corn syrup in the brewing process, a product some have associated with obesity, while other brewers apparently do use corn syrup. We received your corn syrup by mistake. That's not our corn syrup. We received our shipment this morning. You're joking. Try the Coors Light Castle. They also use corn syrup. <sighs> Can you smoke outside? <laughs> oh, brewers of Coors Light, is this corn syrup yours? Well, well, well. Looks like the corn syrup has come home to be brewed. <laughs> To be clear, we brew Coors Light with corn syrup. Ah. Bud Light, brewed with no corn syrup. The National Corn Growers Association wasted no time in responding. It tweeted, Bud Light, America's corn growers are disappointed in you. Our office is right down the road. We would love to discuss with you the many benefits of corn. Thanks, Miller Light and Coors Light, for supporting our industry. Miller Lite responded too, tweeting, Hey Bud Light, thanks for including us in our first Super Bowl ad in over 20 years. You forgot two things though, we have more taste and half the carbs. It's Miller time. Miller Coors tweeted back at Anheuser that none of its products are a use high fructose corn syrup. Apparently there is a difference, while a number of Anheuser-Busch products do. Meanwhile, Samuel Adams got into the act as well. It tweeted that it is brewed with no corn syrup and no rice. Everyone has a recipe. And speaking of that, are you confused about the right fertilizer to use in your garden? It happens. Here's Gary Bachman with a way to tell the difference before you get knee deep in your garden planting season. Selecting fertilizers can be a confusing decision many gardeners face each year. Today, let's clear up that confusion. Regardless of type, any fertilizer you buy will specify the percentage of nutrients it contains, primarily nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. This is called the NPK ratio. For example, a fertilizer labeled with a ratio of 7, 22, 8, contains 7% nitrogen, 22% phosphorus, and 8% potassium. Let's look at some common products. Granular fertilizers are made from synthetic sources. These contain readily water-soluble nutrients that are released quickly in response to rain or irrigation. But this quick release can injure roots if heavily applied. Water-soluble fertilizers are just like the name sounds. These are dissolved in water before applying. I think this is an easy way to feed all of your plants at the same time while watering. Controlled release fertilizers have a coating around them, which controls the release of nutrients in response to rain or irrigation, and feed your plants over a period of time. There is also a time period indicated in months 
as to how long the fertilizers are effective. Organic fertilizers, I prefer by many gardeners. These products release their nutrients slowly by breaking down in the potting mix, rather than relying on moisture to solubilize the nutrients. Feeding your plants is not rocket science. You can't go wrong with any of these products. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. You don't want to start off on the wrong foot with a fertilizer mistake, that's for sure. Because nobody would think you had a green thumb if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, with each passing day, we are starting to get some idea about potential planted acreage this spring and summer. More corn in the U.S. is now one firm's prediction. Meanwhile, the price of cotton remains flat, but a larger U.S. crop could happen. As pulpwood prices head north in one part of the state, and for a good reason. On February 9th, the National Cotton Council releases its annual planting intentions report for cotton. But as early as two weeks ago, Informa Economics came out with its estimates of U.S. planted acreage this year. Their economists call for 91.5 million acres of corn to be planted nationwide in 2019, over 2 million acres more than a year ago. But there will be fewer acres of soybeans in the ground, just over 86 million acres, according to Informa. Trader Ted Seifert says he's comfortable with these numbers. Fairly close to what I'm looking for, 91 and a half million acres in corn. <coughs> um, I think they're maybe a little bit low on their soybean acreage because you know I don't see all that other acreage going to cotton and other things. Um, but yeah, you know, it's right in the wheelhouse. I think somewhere in the low. 91s is probably where we'll land on corn. Uh, and as far as soybeans are concerned, I think somewhere between 86 and 88. Um, a lot of acres have been decided on, but there are still some swing acres, and that could still be another three or four million acres out there, maybe five or six million. So uh, I don't think we're quite there yet as far as a final decision, but yeah, for right now, I'm, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with the numbers that inform the data. China's recent announcement to begin buying some U.S. rice opens the door for th things to happen in other markets, most notably U.S. wheat. Analyst Sue Martin explains what she's seeing out there and also discusses some spinoff for the corn market. What it does more for me is it really comes back into play not only on global stocks but in domestic stocks of the U.S. where we are tightening our wheat stocks as we believe, and then globally, wheat stocks are coming down. When you have corn stocks tightening globally, and then you've got wheat stocks tightening, and now rice, the last one to throw in, because coarse grains and mm -hmm. corn and wheat are in that, but you throw in now rice, rice is interchangeable for wheat globally for food, and so all of a sudden, now you've got all of them. Now you've got a story that puts an underpinning under the brake. The president and CEO of Staple Cotton says he expects to see a bigger cotton crop in the Mid-South this year, primarily due to lower prices for soybeans. For the U.S. as a whole, Staple Cotton is forecasting a 21.7 million bale crop for 2019. Acreage is expected to be down slightly in the southeast. Trader Elaine Cubb shares some thoughts she's having about the cotton market as we get a little further into February. So cotton has, has kind of moseyed along higher alongside some of these other agricultural markets in the past couple of weeks, and that's been good. But the difference is it doesn't have this uh, uh, downside pressure. It's not coming up against recent highs that would make people want to sell it. So actually, I see continued upside for cotton, maybe not 80 cents, but I'm not in a big hurry to, to be selling cotton at this point. Well, you might be in a big hurry to see our trivia quiz for this week. It's very timely. And here it is, where was the first Arbor Day held? So what do you think? Is the answer A, Nebraska, B, Alabama, C, Virginia, or D, Indiana? We'll have that answer coming up for you on Farm Week. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, imagine a farm that's only 400 square feet, uses only eight gallons of water a day, grows a variety of crops without the sun, with a crop cycle from seed to harvest in eight weeks. Can you actually make a living this way? Yes, you can, and we'll meet an urban farmer harvesting his way into the hearts of his customers. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away.
Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. making the best better. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Before we get back to Layton's market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Just one item today, but it's a big one, the 10th Annual North Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Conference at the R&E Center in Verona. It's an all-day affair from 8 to 5 with numerous presentation and hands-on teaching of all aspects of commercial horticulture production. The $25 registration fee includes handouts, snacks and coffee and email newsletters during the growing season. For more information, call 662-566-2201. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Our brighter days ahead for the U.S. pork industry in 2019. As with several commodities right now, a lot of that answer has to do with China and what happens with the trade talks. But when we're talking hogs, the answer also has to do with the ongoing African swine fever outbreak in China. ASF is expected to result in the culling of up to 5% of China's market hogs and up to 10% of their breeder hog inventories. A shortage of pork products is unavoidable there, you might say. Here's Trader Mark Gold with more. Are the Chinese going to come for the pork? We know that there's been more cases of the African mm -hmm. flu showing up. Longer term, which is why I think we're seeing the back months at a $20 premium to the nearbys, because we believe that they're going to want some pork. And everything tells me that this pork market we thought once the December cattle went off the board, we could see the rally. We mm -hmm. haven't seen that. We've broken because of the concerns about demand, because of the uh, African flu situation. But I think longer term, this hog market is okay. Well, there's been a natural resistance in the hog market at 90 bucks. So if we see the Aprils get up to 90, is that a good spot to buy some puts for the spring and the summer? Probably is. Southeast Mississippi is becoming a good spot for jobs in the forestry products industry. A company that makes wood pellets used as fuel in overseas power plants is coming to town. And Viva Wood Pellets is building a production plant in Loosedale and a terminal to load the finished pellets onto ships in Pascagoula. Extension's John Owl says the development should boost pulpwood prices in the southeast corner of the state for everybody. The pellet, pellet industry really competes with the pulpwood industry, and so we're getting higher prices already for pulpwood down in southeast Mississippi, which means that there's more competition, and that's always good for prices. And so adding another, an, another mill in that area that takes essentially the same material can only have an upward, uh, an, an upward pressure on those prices. And so hopefully the private landowners in southeast Mississippi will, be, will benefit from that. Now that mill, I think, is probably 16 months out Right, but uh, but still, I mean that that's 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 a positive indicator, and that and that's a that's a good thing for Southeast. Well, back to another good thing for the state and nation: Arbor Day, the subject of our trivia quiz this week. So, where was the first Arbor Day held in this country? The answer is A, the state of Nebraska, in 1872. If you live in the big city and you're not a farmer but you'd like to be, you get a kick out of today's feature story. A creative New Yorker got the idea to start a nonprofit that teaches would-be farmers how to raise high-margin veggies in those large containers you see on ships. Believe it or not, it's working. Here's Peter Tubbs with that story. 
So there's no doubt, and I hope, that during the course of the year here, we will definitely inspire a number of these people to embark on a lifelong journey to be farmers. The here is the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. On the edge of the parking lot of a former Pfizer pharmaceutical plant sit 10 shipping containers. Each has been converted for growing hydroponic vegetables under LED lighting. 10 laboratories for aspiring agricultural entrepreneurs growing food that is unique in product and location. The brainchild of Tobias Peggs, Square Roots is a nonprofit that aims to bring fresh produce to urban consumers by training farmers to build businesses in their communities. Each container has the production capacity of two acres of land and promises a better quality product by maintaining a consistent environment. And obviously people are increasingly moving to the city, right? So we got to figure out how, how to farm um, in those urban areas, whether that's indoors in containers or whether that's outdoors, um, you know, in, in more sort of urban gardens or greenhouses, you know, whatever it is, the more food that's being grown close to the city, the more access that people have got to local food, the better. Square Roots mentors spend a year teaching the how-to of business and hydroponic agriculture to classes of recruits who dream of becoming urban farmers. Few of the entrepreneurs arrive with an agricultural background, so the learning curve can be steep. Farmer Josh Alibur spent his year learning to grow basil and build an audience for his crops. I spent the first two to three months walking around from restaurant to restaurant in Manhattan, meeting chefs learning about what they value, learning about how I can improve my crops, and becoming a better farmer. So the, the startup time was really hard, but it worked because the product that we grow is so fresh, and you say, I harvested this today, they taste it and they say, I've never tasted basil like this. Freshness is only one of the selling points for the Square Roots farmer. Growing crops unavailable in the wholesale and retail supply chain can help close a sale. A lot of these chefs have been in the culinary industry 30 to 40 years. And as a brand new farmer, because I'm growing in a really unique environment where I can grow really unique crops, I can bring them things that they've never tried before. And the taste is, speaks for itself um, because it's growing in the exact environment that it wants. The taste drives a solid price for produce. While a salad mix starts at $10 per pound, rare varieties of basil command $30 per pound at local restaurants. Each farmer develops a customer mix of restaurants and food retailers who buy in bulk and individuals who purchase salad greens through a subscription model. The greens are hand-picked and delivered up to three times a week. So we feel that the, the, the way the product is priced today is definitely mass market, but every single day we work to um, you know, improve the technology, make the system more efficient, that will allow us ultimately to bring down that price and ultimately uh, fulfill the mission that the company has, which is to bring real food to everyone. The physical constraints of a square roots container farm limit the types of crops grown by each farmer to just the small and valuable. Salad greens, kales, sorrel, Swiss chard, and herbs are best suited to the vertical towers inside the farms. Crops grow quickly under the red and blue LED lighting optimized for plant growth. A footprint of only 400 square feet allows a farm to squeeze into tight urban environments and shorten the literal distance from farm to plate. Under LED lighting, some crops go from seed to harvest in as little as eight weeks. The container farm has operating costs of roughly $1,000 per month, but requires only eight gallons of water per day. Once a crop rotation is developed, harvesting can happen each week, year round. So what we're able to do is create unique environments for crops in very urban settings. Um, particularly today we're in bed -Stuy. I personally grow crops that you wouldn't typically be able to find in a local environment. The ability to simulate varied environments is another advantage of growing crops inside a container. If a variety of basil prefers a specific temperature, humidity, or altitude, the environmental controls within a square roots farm can be set to mimic ideal growing conditions. While the ability to grow a high volume of quality produce in a small amount of urban space has been confirmed, price is the next frontier.
for urban container farming to scale up and become affordable for a neighborhood. The cost per pound will have to decline. The fact that we're able to compete now tells us that as we really increase production and bring the cost down, we're going to be able to produce food at a much, much more competitive cost that's better quality than is already existing in the marketplace. Until then, the farm incubator will continue to experiment with a food supply chain that can be measured in yards rather than miles. At the end of the day, I think what the consumer wants is food that they can trust and that tastes really amazing. And if you know your farmer, you trust the food. Once you taste that food, you're won over. Now that's using your head, along with a little bit of elbow grease. It certainly is, Mike, <laughs> and that's one way to get that produce to the neighborhood for sure. But here's another. Next week on our show, Farm Week, in central Milwaukee, in one of our nation's poorest areas, a success story. Fondy Farms, two dozen farmers renting an acre apiece, producing 70 kinds of crops that feed the neighborhood. And this farmer's market processes 12 times the snap dollars of the average market. They're gardening for good, and it's a win-win. That's next time on Farm Week. And a reminder, if you missed the story, look for the past episodes of Farm Week at our website, and that is farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.